Hello and welcome to the IdeaCast interview series, episode number 92. My guest in this episode is Lance Hilsinger. And Lance is a retired child welfare social worker. And he had worked as a social worker for over 30 years in uh, the state of California. And upon his retiring, Lance wrote two books. And they were insights gained from his years of work in social social work and child welfare work and we discuss the books we discuss his perspective and insight gained from those years of work and so i would file this conversation under sense making perhaps uh, some ideas novel ideas for um, how we as a culture in the west or in the united states uh, could could vision some new ideas and some new thoughts so uh, if I could set it up that way, that's great, and I hope you all enjoy this conversation or, or find it informative, and thank you so much for being here. I'd like to welcome Lance Hilsinger to the IdeaCast interview series. I'm looking forward to a conversation that will take me into a terrain that I am uh, con- I confess I'm not familiar with, and I want to learn more from Lance. I also want to extract from Lance insights gained from his 34 years in child protective services uh so lance welcome glad to have you here as a guest thank you justin thank you for having me yeah absolutely and i think this is an important conversation um to the youtube audience uh thank you for your time welcome uh it's asymmetrical you can't really interact with us in real time but uh you're welcome to leave comments below uh lance's uh, socials will be available, whatever I can have down below in the links in the description field, there will be links there for you. So welcome to you all as well. So Lance, let's be traditional here and talk about you for a moment and what brought you uh, along in terms of aspiration or um, you know thinking about it in your youth what or your youth as in college, perhaps. <laughs> uh, what led you uh, to to end up where you were in social work? Well, I, I left uh, Vanderbilt. I got my um, bachelor's degree in psychology and political science from UCLA, and then immediately entered a master's uh, program at uh, Vanderbilt and got my master's, and then returned to my native California and was working with um, dual diagnosis uh, young adults right, um, who were both developmentally delayed and had some sort of mouth, mental health a- aspects. Okay. So... Um, this is in the pre-internet era. I, I had a partner that we worked with, and she suggested, well, why don't we take so-and-so down and see if we can get him a job working as a county cafeteria as a dishwasher. Mm-hmm. So I uh, we went down to the hall administration in downtown Los Angeles as a field trip, which we kind of did with these with the group anyways. We did various field trips. And there was all the jobs that LA County off, offers you know, from animal control to zookeeper, you okay. know, and child, uh, child care worker, child, child welfare worker came before dishwasher, fortunately. And that's okay. how I found out about the job. Okay. And so looking for a job for a client, I found a job for myself. I started uh, uh, in Long Beach with a, what is now child protective, child welfare services as a standalone agency. Um, and then uh, was in Pomona for a while, and then uh, fortunately got to, after five years in LA County, um, went to San Luis Obispo County. Okay. And in, in all except for my first year in Child Protective Services, which was dealing with emergency response. In other words, somebody makes a call to the hotline, and we respond sometimes with the police, usually not, uh, and investigate that. So the first year I did those emergency response cases. Mm. In one form or another, the next uh, 33 years were all court cases. Um, in the grand scheme of things, the court system makes a big decision between when they take uh, dependency of the child. In, in California, we call it dependency. Other states, they call it uh, child in need of services, which I think is an awful term mm-hmm. uh, because um, it's really the parents that are needed services. If your child has been victimized, it's really the parents that you're needing that to provide yeah. services for. I don't like that term, but that's used in many states. And so for most of my career, roughly two thirds of my career, I was what we call a, a court worker. Okay. And that explains to the court, the juvenile judge, why you think that 
why you think the state should take legal jurisdiction of a child and also what should happen. Um, and uh, sometimes you may dismiss a case. The typical reason you might dismiss a case is that something helped happen in the mother's home. Typically it was drugs and neglect. Mm -hmm. And then you had a responsible father who you could uh, place the child with and you just to take jurisdiction to make new custody orders. That happened at times, but not very frequently. The more typical mm -hmm. situation is the child is placed in, in foster care um, either with a relative or in a, you know, a regular foster home. We use the term foster care to refer both to relative placement and for licensed foster care. And then there's some exceptions, but generally you had 12 months for reunification. Um, the laws changed and got a little more complicated over the years. That 12 month rule was would be shortened to six months in some situations mm. and extended to 24 months in very rare circumstances that the parents would have to get the child back. Okay. And so that's that's what I did. And then uh, when I first started in child welfare, there was a lot of chaos in the system. A lot of uh, rules didn't make sense um, of the amount of services that children and parents could access was was slim. And I was very angry at the system, even though I loved my job, I was kind of angry at the system. So I, I started writing a book while I was still a worker in LA. Over the course of my career, of course, the system changed some, mostly for the better, but in my book, In Place of the Parent, Inside Child Protective Services, I show some places where it has not improved. Okay. And then because so many of the children that come into foster care come from parents that are poor. In California, um, parents who are poor uh, get represented by an attorney. And the vast majority of our cases, the parents qualified. In some states, because child welfare is considered a civil procedure, and those uh, the parents are, don't have a constitutional right to a, an attorney. I think that's wrong. Mm. So you, you state can take your kids away, <laughs> uh, and you're not represented by an attorney. But if you get arrested for, you know, disorderly conduct or something you get an attorney right. yeah <laughs> you have a right like to that. counsel yeah, yeah. <laughs> that, that is a gap i would think yeah, yeah absolutely absolutely and to speak more broadly um and you've revealed quite a bit about child protect protective services and what you've just said but to speak more broadly and again i'm coming into this with very little uh, upfront in knowledge of what goes on. Um, I at one time wanted to volunteer for guardian ad litem, uh, which I guess is sort of a civilian kind of you know, uh, thing. We could talk about that. But anyway, that's the very tiny little thing that I know about what happened. So could you speak uh, broadly to what Child protect Protective Services is and does? And maybe it's through the lens of California law, but uh, you know, as, as broadly as can be possibly uh, spoken. Well, and, and, and that's a good question. If you make the terminology child protective services, you're kind of looking at a child has been mistreated and you're responding, you're kind of focused on the immediate issue. If you talk more broadly about child welfare, not only you're talking about the protect, immediate protection of the child, what's going to be the long-term child's best interest? Mm -hmm. You know, and here's just a, this is a pet peeve for me. I, the legal code says best interest singular, but I think it should be plural, just as you say, all the many fishes of the sea, you know, that's mm -hmm. uh, grammatically correct sentences because you're talking about different species. You should talk about the many interests the child has. So I personally think, and I write this in the book, uh, that best interests plural of a child is what the court should consider, but the legal is in the singular. Mm -hmm. um, and and given the nature of, of the people who craft that language, it's interesting that you make that point that it is dynamic and there are multi-aspectual uh, values to interests versus a singular interest. But maybe are they framing that in the context of that this is, you know, the immediacy of the endangerment of the child and the separation from the uh, aggravating agents or factors or whatever? Or do you think it's just a mis- uh, over uh, overlooking uh, what you pointed out. I, I think it's a historical term. There's still some archaic okay. language that okay. that stays around. That's my personal belief because okay. I think it was best interest, probably written that way in the 30s, and has always stayed that way. Okay, when, uh, so it's an artifact, basically. It's an artifact, yeah. Okay, all right. Um, and 
In California, uh, the social worker prepares what's called a, a petition and a detention report. They're called different things in different states, an affidavit, uh, goes by other names. And in most states, an attorney, uh, a state attorney does the petition. But in California, the uh, social worker does both. And you basically, the petition says, judge, in legal language, we think that such and such, such and such applies to this child. And the detention report goes into more detail of the circumstances and gives a, a general overview of the situation, not just the immediate things that have happened, but so whatever background is available and relatives that who care for the child were already caring for the child. And then you skip to the phase where you have jurisdiction and disposition. The jurisdiction is, are the facts true or what facts are true? And then disposition is, what are we going to do? Mm -hmm. And very often people's minds, those are blurred, but in the legal system, they're very distinct, even though if they're held at the same time. And then, and then, like I said, the parents have so many months to, from the initial removal date, to uh, reunify with their child. And there's periodic review hearings at least every six months. That's something that's standard around the country. Okay. Now, I would intuit that there is a calculus built into um, the legal maneuvering that goes on when there are determinations made that the child is in danger or that something has occurred that is crossing a line. Is Are, are the police the first... Uh, 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 front frontline adjudicators of this thing or, or people who are de detecting these kind of uh, malfeasances or whatever they would call it, you know, these things that are happening to children. Where, uh, what, what is that calculus? And um, are the, you know, is it, I, so I'll start, I'll stop there. Cause again, I, I, I'd like to, I don't know any, <laughs> I don't know any of this. Law enforcement has an authority on in California on certain types of cases as, okay. but but child welfare in most states, the social worker can take legal action on their own. A typical situation where where the police would not be involved generally is maybe where a child has been left in the care of a relative and the, and the mother, it's typically the mother, uh, just is nowhere to be found. The child has never been physically endangered because the the parent had the mother had the foresight to place the child with the responsible person. But that responsible person needs to sign for medical care, needs to sign for school, needs to go on. And so the child needs some legal status. So typically law enforcement would not respond to that. And child welfare would, would file a petition to say, you know, here's, here's this child that we need to get a legal status for. You also have situations where somebody who is, and I talk about one case where people are severely mentally ill. They haven't done anything to the child but they're just not capable of caring for a parent uh, or caring for a child as a parent. Mm -hmm. And the legal standard for that is very high. Um, you have to have two psychologists have to agree and blah, 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 but there's the legal standard. So it's not just your typical slightly depressed person or slightly, you know, right. There's a know, pathology. That he, there's, there's a real severe. So this thing. And okay. so uh, there's, uh, there are situations where uh, social uh, the child welfare system does not need law enforcement. A, a, a very typical thing would be a child born with drugs in the system at birth. Okay. The police typically will not investigate that, but child welfare obviously needs to intervene. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, and it may interest you, some of your listeners, I don't want to go too off on a tangent. In some uh, jurisdictions, if a child is born under the influence of illicit substances, that doesn't necessarily mean that they will file or take bring a case okay. to bring that child into the system. Okay. And I, th I think that's a miscarriage. A child who's born with uh, illicit substances, that woman has a very severe drug problem. Yeah. Uh, people who dabble in drugs, uh, a woman who dabbles in drugs and then gets pregnant, a lot of women will quit. That yeah. would be the yeah. thing for them to quit. Yeah. So if you're, if you're using to where it's detectable in the last month of your pregnancy or what, that's, that person needs help. Yeah. So yes. I, I think that's one of the things I argue against or I argue for in the book is yes, you need to intervene. You're mm -hmm. not doing a service to the child or the mother because if you don't intervene, the problem will get worse. So that's one of the ways I don't think the system works too well now. Okay. And in your book, In Place of the Parent, uh, and we had talked about this before we started this conversation, recording this conversation, that um, these are insights that would be of value to people in that system, in, in what you do in the uh, profession, I guess, maybe is a good way yeah, to put it. Yeah. But 
So, um, so to the members of the audience, if you're drawn to this conversation, again, uh, links will be below to access that book. It's, it's a good handbook or good insights. And there's also anecdotes in the book as well, right? You mentioned um, instances in the book. Yeah, I try to give some child. examples of why the different types of cases, because okay. I think in our, our mind's eye, you have one type of think of a, a child being abused and neglected and just um, in under California code, a very 300A was physical abuse. So if you filed a case under 300A, that was just straightforward physical abuse. Very, very few cases would be filed that way. Maybe at most one a year. Usually there was something else. There was domestic violence, there was mental health issues, there was substance abuse, but a pure just the parent went over the line and discipline, those kind of cases are very rare. Mm -hmm. um, and there's a specific section in California law for a child under the age of five. If you've brutalized a child under the age of five, there's a special uh, subsection for that called uh, 300E. Again, maybe I would have one case a year like that, maybe two, you know, at the most. So most of the bread and butter of child welfare services is, is uh, uh, neglect due to drug abuse or substance abuse. Okay. But Did you have you... lots of other categories too, of course. Yeah, I'm sure. I'm sure. Did you find um, outreach from non-bio parents like the aunt, grandmother, extended family that were charged with the task of the rearing the child while the bio parent may uh, be off uh, with, you know, with their um, substance uh, issues and so forth? Um, do, do they reach out to the system for assistance or, or you know, to social workers or to uh, not necessarily your child protective services? But um, do you see that happening or do they just kind of insulate and try to... Uh, well, no, or do they take advantage of what the state can offer? Typically, when the child is removed, we ask the parent, or we're actually not typically we're mandated to ask, are there any relatives to care for the child? Okay. And then, and then you place the child with the aunt or or grandmother. It's almost always someone on the maternal side of the family. Okay. Um, and uh, and then they're offered uh, foster care and medical care for the child, and that and. The social worker has to visit every once a month mm -hmm. to make sure that everything's going okay. And then you asked about the um, guardian ad litem program. Mm -hmm. um, in some states in California, it's called CASA. In some states, it's called guardian ad litem. Mm -hmm. Those are trained volunteers. Their backgrounds are checked, and they write a child-centered uh, report. The social worker's report tends to be a little more legalistic, uh, says, okay, what have the parents have been doing? The And what have the child been doing? The cost reports tend to be a little more, for lack of a better word, and, and uh, folksy. You, what's the what's this child's daily life like? Mm, what, are, okay. what are they, and, and what what's, they also also offer an opinion of what's best, uh, where, where, you know, should the child remain in placement? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I'll reframe the question I asked a, a moment ago. Um, if the bio parent voluntarily surrenders the child without any state awareness of this uh, to a grandparent or to an aunt, do those secondary caregivers then reach out to the state for what may be available in terms of foster support, uh, financial or otherwise? Do you get and that then, very often? Or again, it doesn't. It... It, it doesn't come very often. Very often, but sometimes we will we have people who will say. Uh, you know, I've been sharing for my my granddaughter for two years or two months, and now I have to roll her in school, and I don't know where my daughter is, mm -hmm. and I don't know, and, and I think Zilch of the dad, or I don't know where he is. So okay. sometimes that happens, not a lot, but it's not unheard of. In your work that you did as a uh, uh, child protection services worker, did you interact with those volunteers, or have any? Did you cross paths with the guardian ad litem or, or whatever the acronym for in California was? Or was it yeah, they were um, two separate things? They're 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 two different names for essentially the same thing. Mm -hmm. um, the cost of workers in typically would not be assigned until they were uh, the child was declared a dependent. Um, but very often we would have like a, a, a get acquainted meeting with the cost of worker. So I dealt with some cost of workers as a court worker because once the child was declared a dependent. Then it'll be transferred to another another social worker. Now people say, well, that sounds kind of stupid. Um, but the 
thing is the court workers are in court quite a bit. We can't be doing off providing all the services. And because of the nature of the court system, it's just not practical for a court worker to also handle cases where there's long-term foster care or reunification cases. You have to bifurcate those two things. And sometimes it's just good to have the parent have a break with a new someone new. Um, not that they may have been a perfectly good worker, but then they get a fresh start, whatever animosities or anger they had about the person who, from a legal perspective, was asking the uh, judge to take their child, then, then they're dealing with somebody else new too. So there's a lot of reasons why you have a new worker once the child is declared dependent. And the cost of workers, most of their work is done after the child is, is declared dependent. That may be very in other states. I'm not familiar that much with the practice in other states, but that was in California too. Okay. And in your experience, when a child went into the foster care system, were there uh, mechanisms of support in the in the psychosocial sense, like uh, psychotherapy or psychology, psychologists or therapists, to uh, orbit around the situation, or or were the foster parents more or less out on their own with that? Uh, Potential. I, I think this. I think the system has improved with that as far as services for children, um, and children were would get into mental health treatment. I found the services for the parents often lacking. Mm. Um, we had. I had lots of moms on my case to enter residential treatment programs for their substance abuse programs. Some of these programs, a good number of them, they were allowed to have their child with them after they were in the program a month or six months, mm. or, I'm sorry, a month or two months, they were allowed to have the child with them in their program. So they had, they got intense services. Fathers, uh, it was very, I, I don't know of any program where a father could have a child, uh, his child with him in a residential treatment program and residential treatment programs for men were few and far between. Mm. So the, there's this thing and that's uh, um, yeah, that's out there. And as far as just counseling services, um, you know, therapists have to go with a DSM free diagnostic statistical manual. Okay. This person yeah. is diagnosed with, with such and such. And, and then we can bill under this because they are, they're diagnosed with this. We can bill Medicare or Medi-Cal. Mm. Uh, it's confused because in medic it's Medi-Cal in California, but it's Medicaid everywhere else. Okay. Um, <laughs> um and we can build because we have a diagnostic code. But sometimes a lot of people have issues. Their, their child's been removed. Maybe they've had some drug problem, but that's not the real big issue. Maybe they have uh, some other issues that's going on in their life to just sort of your generic counseling. That was hard to get people into services or mm -hmm. people who, who just were overwhelmed, uh, but they didn't really fit the clear of having a mental health problem as a as like a schizophrenia or something or severe depression that they just are having issues your child's taken away you're going to have some emotional trauma going on that's a trigger yeah <laughs> yeah and 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 you may need somebody to talk to to just kind of process it to coach you along the way and the social worker can do some of that but it's nice to have somebody else and so that that was my thing with with i wish there were more services for the parents yeah yeah and like you said the father I was listening to an interesting conversation on the radio today, and they were talking to uh, two natal psychotherapists or perinatal psychotherapists, uh, psychiatric uh, doctors who work with uh, that uh, peri uh, postpartum depression, uh, mm. peripartum depression, and uh, there was it was brought up that men certainly don't go through childbirth and they don't have the hormone thing going in the neuropsychiatric sense, but that there is nothing there. It is, uh, there is really not much going on for the father if they have uh, two or three children and, and obviously it affects the framework of the family and so forth. It, 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 so it's, I'm not doing apples to apples with what we're walking into here, but it just points to a larger fact. I think that, uh, those who might need it the most, those who could be most uh, uh, have the predilection for violence and things like that, there seems to be a big void there um, for for men, I guess, to to round it out. And you pointed that out a moment ago that that there's not, in terms of crisis intervention or state uh, intercession into into these kinds of affairs and matters with families. Uh, you know, the, the the prime agitator might be the parent, the male parent. 
as a as a violent person or you know psychosis or whatever whatever the story is. Uh, so I, I I'd love to wave my magic wand and know that you know we could <laughs> we could somehow uh, you know get get that as part of the solution uh, to to make sure that there are interventions there uh, that help with that with the violence and all the other things that go along with that. There are there are there's um we had a local program called uh, Men Helping Men. And uh, that would be people, guys who have been committed. To, we don't say sp domestic violence. You don't say spouse abuse anymore. Okay. You know, and um, there'd be a mandatory, if they were convicted, mandatory 52-week class. Okay. So, so there was help. And the success rate was relatively good. Like all programs, it's not 100% successful. But yeah. it, was, it was useful for them. Paying for it got to be an issue sometimes. And mm. I think they kind of negotiated that, a little bit of resolve that. But there are frequent out there, and I want to don't want to go into a lot of particulars, but I do have to mention one program um, that goes by different names. Uh, my book uh, say it's a dependency drug dependency court. The name changed to family treatment court, and that was where people with substance abuse problems would be a, would have a court proceeding outside of the juvenile court process, and they would meet periodically once a week at first, and then as they progressed less often with the judge and the judge would say, how are you doing in your treatment and have a conversation. And the normally in, in the juvenile court processes, the, it's very confidential, but in this case, in this court, everyone who's in family treatment court is there at the same time. Mm. And so um, there's social pressure on somebody that they can see, okay, Jane's telling everybody a story. Jane's telling the judges or, or, or they're making a success. You know, they got the first unserved supervised visit with the child or they got the first job in a while. And so that, that, that I wanna give people who are listening, you know, who may be a little jaded about the system, there are reasons to be jaded, but that kind of program, that family treatment program was fairly successful and, and is replicated in various forms uh, throughout uh, the country. Good to know, good to know. And in the same vein-ish kind of, um, with regard to adult children of these pathways or or uh, you know the the stages of life and growing up uh, having been through um, say an involvement with child protective services living in a violent home etc abuse um, is there follow-up support for uh, post adolescence or you know early adulthood where where there may be just even voluntary support groups for uh, people who have been through the system. I mean, I guess maybe it doesn't correlate that strongly, but just some sort of support mechanism in an ad hoc kind of voluntary, you know, support group kind of way. Is there anything like that at all for the well the, adult the, children we, of these? It, there is now a program in, in most states called extended foster care. So if a, a kid who was uh, in, entered foster care as a youth, and then from 18 to 21, they can remain in foster care as so long as they're uh, working or going to school or a combination of the two. And the person to support them, there's uh, programs that are like job training, job interview skills, that kind of stuff to support. And there's also a social aspect and things like that. There's programs like that out there. As far as the person who has had some sort of traumatic background and then has hit you know, their adulthood and then they've had some trauma, then you've got the mental health system and that has its limitations if you're poor yeah yeah that's why i was there's wondering waiting, if there was any kind of oh god yeah that's why i was wondering if there was anything you know sort of uh, decentralized non you know organized in a sense from a hierarchy or a state or anything like that or even a private you know something that where people just come together on their own volition and say I'm a victim of, of you know, this the child abuse and I went through the fostering system and I want to share with others to show that we're we're normal. A, a, lot, of, a lot of young adults kind of just want to put it past them. Oh their okay. attitude is I'm done with the system. I yeah. wanna I, I'm gonna go on and start start my life anew and and you know um, okay. I'm I'm done with things, anything associated. That's a very common attitude. There's not mm -hmm. this well, somebody helped me and uh, saved me from a situation that could have been worse. No, there's a lot of like, I'm done. <laughs> yeah. And of yeah, course, so. I, I get that and I can empathize with that. But then you know, I don't know much, but I just know that and, and I came from a very mildly psychologically abusive childhood that, um, you know, support would be good and resolution and, and, and sort of um, sorting out the matter 
as an adult. You know, you, you're you're 14 and you're being abused, or 10 and being abused. It's one thing, and then you process the best you can. But when everything starts to gel into adulthood, I'm thinking uh, maybe there's opportunities there to uh, just form again a sort of decentralized supports. You know, again, I'm just thinking out. Yes. Yeah. Just, yeah. Out I, I don't know. In you know, uh, as far as San Luis Obispo has a fairly rural population, we're semi-rural county. I'm mm -hmm. sure there's such support groups exist in metropolitan areas, mm. uh, but probably um, you know, certainly not in the rural or rural areas that you have that little demographic. Yeah. You know, that's a, you're talking a very small demographic of children. And that's kind of to, to lead into the other book, why um, Bilderberg Bridge, Social Policy for the 21st Century, talk a lot about demographics, mm -hmm. talk a lot about how um, we have a lot of poverty in this in America. And what are we doing? What we tried the war on poverty. Where where are we with those kinds of programs? Mm -hmm. um, and it has reduced the poverty level rate. Poverty level rate before the war on poverty was in the high teens. Now the poverty rate is you know like around eleven percent. It bounces around a little bit. But so in the sense of keeping more people out of poverty, these programs have been successful. But in sheer numbers, we have more people. We have more, you know, we have more people today in poverty than when the Statue of Liberty was, or, and then there were entire population in the United States when the Statue of Liberty was erected. Mm. And you know, the United States doesn't really change in size, you know, and we did add you know, some states, but, right. you know, right. as, as I point out, as uh, in California in my lifetime, <laughs> the population of uh, California has about doubled. But the size of California has not doubled. Right. And, and just the sheer number of people who um, who need who need housing, who need a decent job. And, um, you know, I just like the number of self-pay checkout stands at both at grocery stores is increasing because it's a labor saving device. But that throws out somebody who might have a decent, you know, if you were a union, as I talk in the book, if, if you're a union Cashier, you make a decent salary, not a lot, but you know you make something that's more or less livable. But if you've got nothing because you've been replaced by a self checkout stand, that's a lot harder. And where does our our society deal with that? Yeah, it's almost like they're putting the cart in front of the horse when it comes to this uh, better living through automation kind of thing. Uh, that you know, we're not accounting for the uh, loss of the jobs. You know, twenty. 15, 20, 30 years ago, it was jobs being shipped overseas and now they want to automate things and they have been automating things like toll booth workers. And I was listening to a radio article today about autonomous vehicles in San Francisco getting in the way of emergency services vehicles. They didn't code for that. You know, they didn't code for lights and, and emergencies. But, you know, those cars out there, those autonomous vehicles are sort of the future of Uber driving and taxiing and things like that. So, yeah, I agree. Um, there's no uh, governing of this thought, you know, that we can just automate things and, you know, everybody will just somehow miracle salaries for themselves. <laughs> yeah, and, and, seems... and one of the things I, I point out in the book is like one of the things where automation has come out a lot is, is the manufacturing sector, mm -hmm. you know, compared to like the 1990s, there's roughly two thirds of the job in manufacturing. Oh, it bumps up a little bit, it bumps a little bit, but it's not anything like it used to be. And in part, in large part, because of automation and also because of foreign competition. Mm -hmm. But where those manufacturing jobs were mostly men, mostly men working in factories, roughly two thirds men in fact, that factory mm -hmm. work, except for, uh, you know, uh, in the garment industry, that was mostly female. But I mean, yeah. And um, where does that, where does that person who might have in a previous generation had a decent job, who they could buy a house, they could. When they buy a house and they eventually die, their children would inherit that house. Now they they pay a, a, a rent that you know they never, they don't build equity, and we we have uh, these demographic factors that are really making it hard. And people blame oh, blame the liberals or blame the conservatives being cold harder or blame the liberals spending too much money. Yeah, the thing is is really demographics, and that's mm -hmm. um, that's a reality that we don't have enough discussion about. I think. Yeah, I think a lot of that rhetoric is a false dichotomy. You know, it's not solution oriented 
I'm all for rhetoric, but it has to be productive rhetoric or preferably dialectic, you know, where you're trying to get a, a solution, you know, or something to it. So, yeah, I agree. And so this is a good, strong segue uh, to uh, build a better bridge uh, because you are outlining some insights that you've gained from your 34 years as a social worker or as a child protective services uh, worker advocate. And if that's if I'm not imposing that on you. Um, so. Yeah, share with us some of your insights and ideas. I mean, we just covered sort of the decline of labor, uh, the decline of good paying working class jobs. And we find ourselves with social blight and and situations that require child protective services en masse sometimes. So, And I think a certain sort of mindset has to change a little bit too. In other words, we, we have this mindset, oh, we, we work hard, you can get ahead in America. I'm reading a book right now by someone who uh, grew up in Cuba, escaped the revolution, his family escaped the revolution, and he worked hard and became a CIA agent. And, uh, mm. you know, so he became successful, but he, um, but I draw an analogy here with like in San Luis Obispo, we're kind of a tourist town. We have municipal parking lots. Until recently, we had parking lot attendants, but now it's mostly an automated system. Mm -hmm. Those people, you know, you might have been the friendliest, help, most helpful parking lot attendant. I say helpful because a lot of tourists will not want directions to wherever, you know, which way is the freeway and that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And you could have been the hardest working, best parking lot attendant, but oh, your job's automated. Yeah. And and how we are much more attuned to market factors that have nothing to do with your skill level. Mm -hmm. And in today, people are going uh, in, the, in the 21st century, you're going to need uh, social welfare, broadly speaking, um, more often. Um, you're going to more often are going to be, have periods of unemployment. Mm -hmm. And when a person goes on unemployment, they get behind in their bills and, uh, you know, their credit score is down. So even if they get the job two, three, four months down the road, because they went into debt because they lost a job through no fault of their own, their credit score could be damaged for years. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And maybe we're a little bit ahead if we pay people who are unemployed a little bit more. I mean, when you get an employment insurance, yeah. some states it's like 4%. California happens to be 40%. Well, if, if you're struggling to get by on, on a fraction of, of what you used to, you can cut back, but at some point you can't cut back anymore. You're going to get behind in your rent. You're going to get behind in your, uh, you're going to hit the food bank. And maybe you just say, hey, I'm going to steal or I'm going to drift in the criminal lifestyle just to survive. Yeah. So we you know? need to. <laughs> yeah. To, yeah. 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 I'm, going to, I'm going to sell a little weed on the side as I think, you know, and, yeah. and I'm not saying justifying that's right because most poor people are not criminals, but. Well, when there's you have a correlation, to... there's a correlation there. Yeah. yeah. When you're desperate, you're desperate. And, yeah. uh, you know, it's not an excuse. It's just it's a reality. You know, you yeah. you hit hard times. You're going to do what you need to do to feed your family or keep a roof over your head. And, you know, when we had our pre-meet um, a couple of weeks ago, we were talking and I was I got on my soapbox and I, I won't go that far. I won't get on my soapbox. But we were talking about how the logic in uh, corporate bailouts and uh, when when the market takes a turn and we go into a down uh, swing into a recession or whatever, that we do have to uh, uh, augment or or supplement or what, whatever euphemism for, for the market sector. And we build that up. And, and the rhetoric there is that if we don't bail out GM or, uh, you know, what XYZ widgets industry that, um, you know, we could see hardship. And it's the same kind of logic can be applied to the individual that if you don't keep them um, just, you know, on that level of survival, not you know, living well, but just that, so that, that then they can, uh, you know, as what is it, skin in the game is the one you hear a lot right. about that, you know, they get back in the game and do it. So, so I think that could be framed in that sense that, you know, we're not here to have lazy, loafy people on uh, eating government cheese and sitting on the porch uh, <laughs> collecting welfare checks. It's more that, you know, if, if there is a need uh, that it, I think it's the same, I could steel man that argument to, to the individual and say that, you know, this is done uh, as a stopgap or whatever to help Put that person back online but as you pointed out you know we also need to onboard uh decent jobs and 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 for the working class so i'm not speaking for people with a master's degree or a bachelor's and something and they, they have saleable skills but for the working class i just yeah I, I, it's weird right i mean we're, we're getting pressure from two different sides uh, obsolescence for the manual worker or the medium to low skilled worker and then 
uh, you know, austerity in this. Well, we can't afford to, you know, float people when they're in in trouble. That's my yes. soapbox. Sorry. <laughs> right. No. 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 I, I. And I. And I agree with your point that yes, if you frame it, if we're going to bail out a major corporation, why not help the person, the individual? And I've often thought that you know, you know, you don't want government giveaways. But yeah. I've often thought that there should be a situation where a low interest loan, a zero interest loan, you know, mm-hmm. okay, mm-hmm. you're you're uh, on unemployment insurance, but you know, you're behind your house payments. We're not going to give you your house payment. We're not going to give that to you, but here we're going to loan you some X number of dollars at zero interest because we want to keep you in a home because people living in their home loans, that's uh, good for neighborhoods. That's good mm-hmm. for the children. You know, uh, we took, you know, to go briefly back to foster care, kids going into foster care usually have to change schools. Mm-hmm. If you change schools because of, of your financial situation and change schools again, because it's gotten worse, that disrupts the child's education. So there's a social cost to not front ending this. Mm-hmm. You know, and yeah. yeah, no, I agree. Uh, and I don't know any, I'm not, I don't know anything about economics and I don't really, you know, have a big, big lens to view this, but just in my own, you know, 40 odd years of being an adult, uh, yeah, it, it, we, we, we can't, again, we can't attack things in, in, in two fronts, i.e. the, the working class, you know, again, there has to be some bright future for, uh, gainful employment and living wages or, you know, a safety net. Um, and, and, and so an example is people who work, you know, at a big megacorp retailer grocery chain with a W, uh, as the first letter of their business, <laughs> I, I don't want to get sued. So, you know, and, and their workers in my area are making $11 an hour, roughly 11 50 an hour. And if that's not enough to get by, then maybe a UBI of some kind, like another $500 a month stipend from X, whatever taxes, revenue. I think in our pre-meet, you know, you were talking about uh, the market, the uh, uh, what, not capital gains, but there was some, you know, revenue stream that you mentioned that could be uh, tapped uh, for the, I know it would be met with stiff resistance because of people who are well, making there a is lot the, of money. The, there is the earned income credit. Mm-hmm. So if you're, if you meet certain income guidelines and you have worked uh, during the previous year, you can get a supplement from the government. You get a break, break on your taxes. You get earned income credit. Mm-hmm. Um, and this is where I think that we have to look at the scope of the problem. The earned income credit, what that costs the government to give people, and I'm not saying it's a bad thing to do, I'm just saying this is a, as a scale, is the equivalent of the budget for the FAA, the FBI, and the National Endowment for the National Science Foundation. Those, com- those agencies combined and doubled is about what the credit costs. So all these things like, oh, we, we ought to have better law and order, and we ought to maybe say, okay, we're going to have hire more FBI agents because we want to do that. Look at how much that costs, or the FBI is always about, you know, okay, everybody wants safe airplanes, you know, we have to upgrade radar systems and things like that. Mm-hmm. In comparison to other things, that that's, uh, you know, not much. And so we, we need to look at the debate as the cost of not, of you know, of the, of the democratic group of helping. Yeah. Um, and I, and I talk about in the book, if you have, say you have a trillion dollars and, um, you know, if you have a hundred million poor people, you can give them X number of dollars. If you have 150 million poor people, you can't give them as much mm-hmm. each, each individual family. If you only have 75 million poor people and you have a trillion dollars to distribute, well, okay, you get that in services, oh, okay, maybe they can manage. And so we, we need to look at that kind of comparison as well as just the traditional guns versus butter kind of thing. Mm-hmm. You know, how many aircraft carriers equal how many food stamps, you know, that kind mm-hmm. of thing. Mm-hmm. You know, that that's part of the way we look at things. Um, so yeah. I offer some suggestions. I, I don't want this just to be all a a gripe session, you know. I don't mm. talk about all the ills of society in my book. Yeah, because we could we could talk for a while, you know. And and but, of course, I want it to be fair because, like you said in an interview, that you know, you, you go too far left or right, and you start getting into cuckoo stuff, you know. And, and so I, I like to frame things in a kind of centrist approach and and prag- pragmatic as possible, and and leave that kind of sideline rhetoric, you know, behind because it doesn't seem very. As I said earlier, it's not really solution oriented. So I. I'm agreeing with you, and I'm sorry if I derailed you. <laughs> no, no. Well, and and 
you know, I don't, um, one of the things is education. Mm. Um, if you have just a high school diploma, if the person is just a high school diploma, their chances of, um, of needing um, social services sometime in their life increases greatly. Mm. And if you don't, uh, if a young man or a young woman doesn't even have, a, doesn't even get a high school diploma, that even increases even more. Now, a young woman who doesn't graduate high school, she's more likely to go on welfare to get pregnant with a child she doesn't then and then get food stamps and so forth. Not, of course, everyone takes that path, but mm -hmm. statistically it is a greater path than some, a woman who is now, you know, has some college and things like that. She becomes a, 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 an economic drain on society. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The man, the young man who fails to graduate high school, he's more likely to father a child he, he cannot support but he also is more likely to draft into uh, uh, criminal activity. Mm. His failure to graduate is a matter of public safety. Mm. And so we need to focus better on getting more boys to graduate high school. Mm -hmm. uh, and um, the, the, you know, the generally in some of the larger cities, graduation, the dropout rate is close to 25% in some major cities. Mm. And particularly more for, that's like the global, if you talk about white girls, it's less. If you talk about African American, more, it's more. So how can we do that? One of the things I suggest, or two things that I suggest, is to identify the problem. Uh, most school districts have, you know, um, websites. Okay, this is how lovely our school district is, and this is what the cafeteria menu is, and this is our calendar. But I would mandate that they also post the graduation or drop about rate, probably the graduation rate a little more positive, by gender. You identify that, hey, our graduation rate for girls is X, and our graduation for boy is uh, X plus X plus so mm -hmm. much. You mm -hmm. know? And that, will, that just by alone will help focus the problem. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The other thing is, and my daughter is a, a high school English teacher, and one of the people who I talk with who are teachers, They'll say, yes, there's exception. Of course, there's plenty of exceptions, but boys generally don't like fiction. I didn't like fiction very much. I only liked science fiction as a kid. Mm. And the stories that were kind of gla classics, like The Great Gatsby, I just, you know, thought were stupid. I thought, yeah. were, you know, and now if you yeah. ask teenage boys or teenagers, what do you, what, what's about school? What's your one word description of school? They say it's stupid. Mm. You know, that's, yeah. that's the very typical answer. Well, in some ways it is. If you're, if you're having kids, I remember reading Death of a Salesman uh, in, in high school. I thought, this is stupid. And I'm a kid bound, college bound and everything. And imagine some yeah. kid who's just like not interested and all. Right. So I think that what one other thing that I do is at least a year of English. Most schools require, most school districts require, or states, I should say, require three or four years of English. At least one of those years should be nonfiction. Mm, yeah because you're going to have boys more interested, you know, of course there's exceptions, but the general pattern, they're going to be more interested in nonfiction stories. Yeah. yeah. And that will, that will draw kids in, but having them say, because reading fiction doesn't really teach you anything other than maybe words and, you know, plot theory and poetry yeah. and the other stuff that's, Imagination. you know, <laughs> you know, that's, that's yeah. not what you need in a job. You need to be able to write a report when, you know, there's an accident or some other mm -hmm. event you need to be able to, you know, or you Technical. want a sales report or whatever, you need yeah. to be able to write nonfiction. Yeah, yeah. That almost veins into, um, you know, the people who are bound for uh, vocational teaching and, and vocational schools and, and trades and trade schools. It almost makes me wonder if it, if it and this is going way out there in, in abstract conceptual land, is to when children are in, I don't think they call it junior high school anymore, but whatever that thing is below high school that they're calling it now, um, you could start doing some aptitude and assessment and find out who may be inclined towards, like you said, the nonfiction. I, I, I think Cannery Row is the only book of fiction I've ever read in my life. Everything else was either uh, sciencey, biological stuff, or you know, technical things and 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 philosophy and stuff like that. I, I just can't get into somebody else's writing. I don't know why, uh, but because I, I love to read. But anyway, steer those children in that direction and just have, you know, not like a two tier system, but just a concomitant you know, set of criteria uh, or uh, curricula 
for those folks, you know, and catch it early and, and maybe you could stop some of the resistance and they still graduate with a bona fide degree. It's just if kids are more inclined into the, say, the liberal arts or, or humanities versus not quite STEM or, you know, so technical things, but, but, you know, again, for vocation. So I don't know what you think about that, but. Well, uh, just a uh, middle school is the term that's normally referred to as. Ah, sixth, yes, seventh, that's and what it's called now. Yeah. Junior high is seventh and eighth. Okay. And so there's more and more trend because kids are getting more physically more mature than they did mm -hmm. generations ago. They're just physically more mature, particularly girls. That so the trend now is to have middle school of sixth, seventh, and eighth. Mm, okay. I just remember um, 40 years ago it was called junior high when I was coming. Yeah, that's out. Yeah. And, and that's usually yeah. Um, you know, and the. You know, uh, my daughter participated in, four, in uh, you know, FFA. You oh, know, yeah. She yeah. was never interested. And, and I think that that's, those kinds of things teach kids a lot. And, yes, yeah. the, those would be, you know, if you're caring for your pig or, your, you know, whatever, yeah. your sheep. Yeah, that's I was an FFA. All, all those yeah. things are good and, and keep them be harder to do in urban areas. But, yes, you, you need to do those things. But I think that if you make those changes in education yes there's going to be difference of how you apply that in an urban area or mm -hmm. or a rural area there's going to be differences but there's also other things that we can do to engage people to be uh, particularly men to be more successful mm. you know for for each um, man for each woman that's incarcerated there's roughly uh 12 12 men wow you know and why are these men choosing this path and why are they going down that way it's because they're just not being successful in, in, in the mainstream society um and you're right we need to we need to focus on getting getting that um and again that's one of the things is education there but also uh you know talking about that housing mm -hmm. you know, housing is the big issue for so many people my kids the price of housing as a proportion of income, it's keep going and up. Yes, incomes are higher than they were 40 years ago, but the proportionally housing is much higher. Yeah. And it's supply and demand in part. And to encourage owner occupied homes, to avoid corporations buying homes for as rental rent. Homes, yeah. Why not just have a surcharge? If you're a corporation and you're not having uh you're not buying a home for your own personal use there should be like say a five percent surcharge to discourage allow the homo the ordinary person to be able to buy a home mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and then on the other hand if you're if you're the big corporation why not give the big corporation uh, a tax break if they provide owner occupied housing for their sins not rental housing but housing that they can that they can purchase mm -hmm. you know if if you're making uh, money and you can only and you can afford a three hundred thousand dollar home, but homes are selling for six hundred thousand dollars, maybe the corporation goes fifty fifty on you on a house, and you have mm -hmm. some sort of equity thing, and mm -hmm. you add uh, tax incentives so to encourage a corporation to do that. Mm -hmm. So uh, I think there's ways that we can do things without you know you start talking about you know spending money raising taxes you suddenly uh, you've turned off a lot of whole part of the electorate yeah electorate. you lose a lot of people that you way. lose a lot of people so here let's use tax incentives or tax penalties or carrots and sticks to yeah. encourage more affordable housing yeah and and i don't know how you cuz it seems like housing and again, I don't know anything, but it seems like housing has been used as a wealth building tool as well. Not recently, but just, you know, it's it seems like it's been accelerated. Like, you know, uh, just in my own community, I've seen housing values just go up exponentially. And I don't understand, you know, like you said, supply and demand. Yes, but my city, my town has not grown. It's maybe 100,000 people. Uh, you know, they're the big uh, corporations or industries haven't moved here to elevate the uh, our revenue base or our income mm -hmm. base. So I'm 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 baffled at a sleepy little town that I live in with, again, like 100,000 people, how those house values have gone up and mine's gone up. So I'm not complaining and my mortgage I paid <laughs> off. So, hey, you know, who am I to complain? But it's still just an interesting insight. But that, your children want a house and, and right. they, they that, will yeah. invest, they will eventually inherit from you. But. If yeah. you don't own a house, what do you what do that person's children? And I, I'd like to talk a little bit about the appendix to my book, actually. 
Okay. Uh, if I could. Yeah. Uh, yeah. You know, if you imagine um, America as a uh, hundred households mm. and 50 households are renters and 50 households are homeowners and everybody has $10,000 in savings, but each um, homeowner also has $10,000 in equity. Mm -hmm. Okay. So the homeowners own two thirds of the wealth in our hundred household America. But as that equity increases, you know, over 10 years and you, you could pretty soon you've got the homeowners, if their equity continues to go up and up and up, they own like 80% after so many years. Mm -hmm. They're just, you know, and that really, I think to my sense, focuses on how homeownership is the key to uh, allowing the, the, allowing the middle class to continue. Yeah. You know, you get a home, you're sort of middle class. And if you have a home, then you can, if you're laid off a job, you can borrow against the house because your equity has gone up. You can, you can stab off those financial things a little bit easier if you're a homeowner. And how do poor people get homes? Maybe you're lucky and you're, you win the lottery as far as, and I, I don't mean the little lottery, the Habitat for Humanity lottery. Right, they build right. a few. They build a few homes at a time, and they got a gazillion applications for every house that mm. they build. Yeah, you know. Yeah. And so one of the things I talk about in the book is that, you know, in, in Habitat for Humanity, you have sweat equity. So the potential homeowner, they help build a house, or you know, they they put in some sweat equity. Mm -hmm. But you're building one or two houses at a time. You don't really have a lot, of, and you have volunteers coming in, and they have to be trained. It's pretty inefficient. Yeah. So if you have a corporation come in with the same crew, build a hundred houses, you're gonna have uh, you're gonna have a safer work environment if you're having a trained professional crew, and you're also gonna have some just efficiencies. So why don't we have people who need housing? They put in so many volunteer hours in community programs, bona fide community programs, and they log those hours, and you use that as the down payment, as opposed to having to save that three percent. Mm -hmm. uh, that you need an FHA, which could be, you know, uh, you know, thirty thousand yeah. dollars. You know, yeah, that, that that's unreachable, and that way you could build um, people get people in homes uh, with their sweat equity. And again, maybe some sort of uh, situation. We had a minor scandal here, uh, where the new superintendent of schools, the school board offered like a to help out with the mortgage, with the new superintendent's mortgage, and as an enticement. Mm -hmm. And I'm, okay, we're gonna, you know, we're gonna help you with this. And I, that just seemed unfair. Well, what about the teachers? And what about the sec school secretaries? If there's a program like there's some sort of shared equity kind of thing between the governmental agency and the school board or whatever, it is, mm -hmm. and uh, and everybody, that's fine. You know, in in uh, St. Louis Vista, talking about cost, we were a shortage of police officers. Even though mm. police officers make pretty good money, the housing is so expensive that they have to live in outlying areas. Okay. And in particular, it's Santa Barbara has the same problem, very expensive community. There isn't really pockets of people who were people of police officers, teachers' salaries. Right. And there's concern that if there's some natural disaster or Hawaii, uh, the highway closes, that the police officers can't get into town because they're living too far away. You yeah. want police officers, firefighters, teachers living in your community. Embedded. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, so there's a practical need that uh, would capture the interest of those who might not otherwise notice. Yeah, 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 that's a good point. Um, you know, I heard another staggering statistic today, and this is not even, this is apples and oranges, but um, the credit card debt in this country is now at a trillion dollars. <laughs> Again, this is just random, you know, throwing something out there. But I also think it speaks to a kind of consciousness that needs to, I shouldn't say need, that's a strong word, that we all could take a moment to understand um, our fragility when we do things like have a trillion dollars worth of, uh, or that we have housing insecurity. And that and I was starting to say a little while ago that, you know, I really feel sorry for Gen Z uh, who are getting out of college now and they're entering into their 20s and the uh, the prospects um, i've heard a lot of millennials complaining about you know just being sort of estranged from the potential to uh, to get uh, a decent home and home ownership even if they have a degree or whatever so it seems like uh what you're talking about if there is a system a, a, a 
a corporate entity or, or a market system that can do this kind of sharing that it seems to benefit uh, the greater good for both the uh, corporation having a long relationship with that employee and the employee feeling grounded in their ability to um, you know, be a good citizen and, and do that. So yeah, that's a, a laudable uh, consideration or thought that, that we need to focus on. Again, you know, when I think, when I hear something like we're a trillion dollars and that's not, that's not even consumer debt, that's not even mortgages, that's not even all the other things, the, you know, monthly uh, cost of living. <laughs> that's just credit well, well, cards. You know, there's, there's, there's a lot of talk about, oh, a student, student college debt. And people yeah. say, well, you took on that debt, you took on the responsibility. Um, and, and that's true. And, you know, did, did you take out a hundred thousand dollars, you know, to get a, a degree that's unemployable? You know, yes, there's some personal responsibility here. Here's what I propose, though, is there are already lots of programs that uh, if you're a, a, a doctor or a teacher or dentist and you work in an underprivileged area, uh, so many uh, so many years of services that underprivileged area, your your, debt is, your student debt is wiped out. Mm, yeah. And that's fine and good. But teachers, doctors, that kind of stuff, they don't create wealth. Why not let business people, people with business degrees also get that same break or people who are artists mm. who bring, you know, bring, bring something of value that's not necessarily translated in dollars. So anyone can work off their student debt, whatever their major yeah. in a underprivileged area on so many, you know, you know, 10 percent or 15 percent per year or something like that. So that we bring the work ethic that you need to graduate from college, you bring that to the neighborhood. We also bring whatever that value that is, whether that's the business skill or that uh, you know artistic skill or someone who's got a degree in theater arts or something like that mm-hmm. or art you bring that to the neighborhood and then you lift you lift people up so that way you know people can work it off uh, you know their debt and by by helping out society I would ask strictly out of curiosity that who who would be the grantors of those loans uh, how would that how would that uh, upfront loan money be uh, issued or what agency would issue that so that on the back end when they when it's you're paying it forward after you've gotten your uh, degree um, how does that transaction occur or what does that look like so well, so in some, other words some, some, somebody has to verify you can do it by zip code okay this is this area is at the 25 percent uh, poverty level by zip code yeah so you work you work in this area and you're and you have a degree, and your employer verifies. Hi, uh, Jim Jones started a business. If if yeah. you're a county official, so there must there would have to be various different ways of verifying that. Yeah, um, yeah. But what um, what I was what I was curious though is who's the grantor of the loan? Who 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 are the, well, the underwriters of this of this loan? Well, and, people will get their student loans the normal way that they don't get student loans. Are they through private? Uh, Loan generally, grantors. it's through the schools. They're generally through schools. I remember okay. when my oh. kids when my kids applied for college, my daughter almost checked a box and said, "Oh, well, I want to take out a." Tw-. She thought she was getting twenty thousand dollars. She didn't realize. Oh no, 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 Emily, that's a twenty thousand dollar load. Yeah, that's not a twenty. Oh, yeah, it's not a lottery. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. Oh gosh. So yeah. So whatever so, process they would normally go through the loans, it would be okay. So if, if it's a state university, then if it's the public's money, then that, so I'm trying to build a circuit here that you see a completion where we, wherein that engineer, that architect, the even the art, arts person uh, or a lawyer or a doctor can then contribute. Like you said, it's demographically verifiable. There's a zip code, there's a community uh, and there's a, there's a closure there. There's a full circuit uh, in terms of how that payback uh, affects the grantor, which would then be again, if it's the state, uh, that that I'm seeing that circuity there. Right. I I got some of I got much of my students st- student things. I had a I was on a grant, but I got it. I if I didn't work in the field for a while, I'd have to pay it back. And so there was a verification process. Yes, you you were employed in in such mm-hmm. and such an such an agency, and and uh, okay, we verify that, then so you don't have to pay. The money that you went to school on yes mm-hmm. we've crossed over the hour mark um i want to make sure that if you have if there's uh build a better bridge points that you want to make or if there's some um 
maybe broader thing that you want to speak to is can we do that before we end up uh, I I want to give our audience we've we've delivered a lot in this conversation so I want to give them and you're always welcome to come back so let let's let's draw out something that uh, is of value or importance to you that you'd like to share well I'd like to share it kind of like thematically as mm -hmm. as I say in the preface to build a better bridge social policy for the 21st century Neither the liberals nor the conservatives have monopoly on good ideas or bad ideas. Mm. We need, like you said, solution focused ideas. And that's what social workers did. We would have, okay, here's this situation. It's very chaotic. What's the, you know, we called it a case plan. You call it a treatment plan. It goes by various names. But what, where, how, what's the pathway for moving forward? You know, and uh, I talked about, okay, the courts takes jurisdiction of the child because these uh, facts have occurred. The disposition is what are we going to do? That's what are we going forward? So that's kind of what I try to do in the in this book here. How are we going to go forward? Recognize these these limitations. Again, um, it's not going to be one thing. You know, people kind of want want some grand solution. It's chipping away at at uh, education. It's chipping away at at how uh, social welfare programs are managed. It's chipping away at making you know unemployment compensation more realistic. Mm -hmm. So there's a whole lot of things that need could be done. And one of the things I point out in the book is that they're independent. Most of my ideas, you don't have to do all of them. You know, they're, 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 um, food stamps can be targeted to kids. You, teenagers consume more calories. So food stamps can be higher for kids, teens, their teens in the home because they consume more calories than, than, the, than a family and retired couple or, you know, a mother with one teenage boy is going to consume a lot more calories than two retired people just. And so maybe the food stamp allocation should be allocated that way. Those kinds of practical solutions. Mm. And that's kind of what I wanted to focus on. And again, uh, I thank you, Justin, for letting me share some of these ideas. And, yeah. Um, I, I want them out there. And the more that are adopted, I think, uh, that are cost effective, we're going to have a better society. There's no panacea. No. But no. we, we got to try to make it better. Yeah, it's all for me. It's percentages. If we get you know a five percent right. shift in the right, uh, and by right, it's not anybody's opinion. It's just what's the affect, what is the outcome that benefits the most people. So yeah, I agree. Right. If we can make these, it's a glacial thing, but you know, if we can just keep keep it moving and and uh, aspire to see as we touched on in the beginning of this conversation, a better generation, uh, a healthier, happier generation uh, uh, coming after us or yeah yeah after us <laughs> it's kind of yes, un right, under right. Uh, up aging up uh you know, aging with us but right. underneath us in the sense yes, <laughs> however yes. you frame that but anyway yeah right. yeah i that's that that would do my heart so good to to know that the young ones have a better chance uh at a better world so i appreciate the work that you did for 34 years in uh child protective services is there something that uh this is kind of a, a question question for an interview but like if there were a young social worker who found this conversation uh, what sage could you pass to somebody who's just starting in the pipeline right now? If you've come in the field of child welfare, you know, um, it's a very rewarding job in, in an emotional sense. You're going to have good, you're going to have bad days. Mm -hmm. You're going to have days that just are swamped and too much to do and a lot of bad news. I just realized that it, it kind of go ebbs and flows. You can have months where clients or everybody's, following their case plan or most are and then on months where it seems like everybody's hostile and nobody's following through and kids are running from foster homes not because they're mistreated because they just want to run and don't know and follow rules take that as just random events mm. that there's just going to be good days and there's going to be bad days that just be philosophical about it and uh i i Fortunate, I realized that fairly early on. I had a very large caseload. I had seven, seven kids in my caseload in LA County. So at wow. a given time, some people were doing well. Some people weren't doing very well. And so they kind of balanced out. When you have a lower caseload, you're going to just, by random chance, have really tough months. Um, and you just have to just accept that that's just kind of the ebb and flow of life. Mm -hmm. Another another interviewee type question, because um, I'm not a typical interviewer. You know, I just like to have these kind of back and forth conversations. So, but a question that came to mind is, uh, in the course of your career, have you ever come across either randomly by happenstance or just by your curiosity, you've checked in on, or had people come to you and say, 
you know, you handled something in my life, you know, when I was a child or a juvenile and didn't, has that ever happened for you? Have you ever come across former uh, uh, cases? We, we are in, in a small county, so I, I have run into people in public. Um, I don't know that, that anyone has said um, with great gratitude. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, yeah. But um, they have at least we had a, a positive conversation. Okay. You know, in other words, okay, I saw you someone trying to to help, and and we would chat about how the status of things are. Um, I just there happened to be one young lady who, when I talked about extended foster care that I would happen by chance to to see in public fairly fairly frequently, just by chance. And I think that at a certain business, I don't want to get into more details for confidential rails. And yeah, I think that she, she quit going to that business, not because of me personally, but because she wants to be done with the system. And just seeing me kind of reminded her of her old life. Okay. So I have to, since I have, I haven't seen her, I've just have to. So this idea of like, I want to be done with the system. Mm. But as far as parents, and I think that that's true in a small county, let's say you could be arresting your neighbor. You know, mm -hmm. in big cities, you're not arresting your neighbors so much. Yeah. And so I think yeah. that that's one of the things that helps the police be a little more humane about things. So, and I say that my, my nephew's in with uh, LAPD and, you know, it's, it's, it's a different, different ballgame being a, an officer in a big city than being an officer in a, yeah. not that we don't have problems. We don't have difficult people, but oh yeah, it, you, you know, so yeah, no, there's relationships there, or, or at least there's a salience and awareness of the members of but the community. It is a very gratifying job. Okay. It is uh, emotionally very gratifying. When you have those good days, they're really good. Mm, so that's, I bet. that's I bet. Yeah, that's you're you're making a difference. And that's that's gold. Um, so, yeah, Lance, this has been a great conversation. I'm glad to have had you on as a guest uh, so that we could uh, platform your work and uh, bring raise a little awareness. Uh, and, and I just want to acknowledge that and thank you for that. And thank you for having me. Yeah, it's absolutely. Pleasure. Absolutely. Well, it, it was a pleasure on my end, too. I'll say goodbye to you uh, after we're done recording. But to the YouTube audience, thank you for your attention. Uh, again, I'll have everything for Lance in the description field, including, including links to his books. So if you uh, were motivated by this conversation, you can uh, dig in further. So again, Lance, thank you so much. YouTube folks, thank you so much. And I'll uh, see you. YouTube audience in the next conversation. All right, let's give me just a second here and I'll stop the record here.